Good morning. Welcome to the Florida United Methodist Church on this, the last Sunday of February, the 28th, 2021. Oh my goodness, it's just, uh, it's just skipping by. I'm so glad you're here this morning. It's a beautiful week this week in Flora, Mississippi. We're so glad the winter is about over. There was thunder in February, so there'll be a freeze in April. I used to laugh at that, but I bet it's true. I, I have found that to be true. And it's an old wives' tale, but those old wives get it right every now and then. And uh, But maybe this is really the last bad cold spell we'll have. I hope so. Looking forward to March. It starts tomorrow. And we'll be so blessed to get that month started just 21 days away from spring. Listen, I need your mailing address. If you've been getting things from me for the last uh, seven, eight months, however long we've been doing this, since last summer, really, so more than that, uh, I've got it. But if you don't ever receive anything from me in the mail, I need your address. And some things we send out, they come back. So make sure our address for you is current. You can go on YouTube or go on Facebook or whatever you're watching this, whatever device or, or platform you're watching this from and just let us know. We don't care where in the world you live. Just let us know. We'll mail you something. And uh, you don't have to be a part of this congregation. You're part of our online congregation. And we are so glad that you are. Hey, listen, many, many, many people are getting vaccinations. We had a meeting the other night in church and we're about 10 people there. And all of them except one had had the coronavirus. And, and the one who hadn't had it had both vaccines. And so uh, maybe if that's where your faith is, that will give you some confidence into interacting with humans again. I hope that you will. I hope that you're feeling confident and you're able to move on with your life and embrace the good things in life. I know that many people just... Uh, they got to cut something. They don't cut going to the beach. They don't cut going to Disney World. They don't cut going to the mall. They don't cut going to Walmart. But they cut going to church because somehow coming to church is more dangerous than going to Walmart. I don't understand science, so maybe that's true. But I hope that you're feeling better and, and blessed and, and confident that you can live your life however God wants you to live it in the fullness of of his blessing. Have confidence your life is in his hands and your days are numbered by him. So press on with your faith. Press on, press in, and be blessed. I tell you, I just want you to be blessed. Friends, y'all want to hear something special? Nora Kate is about to play her violin. She's playing uh, the chorus of Judas Maccabeus. I believe that's what it's called. And I might be wrong about that because I'm not as smart as she is. But in, in, her, in her defense, she's, she's smarter than everybody. So in, in my defense, she's smarter than everybody. She's our little prodigy around here. And you'll know Judas Maccabeus from after Malachi and before Matthew. There's 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And he lived in there. And he led the Jewish revolt against the Greeks, and he's a Jewish hero. And uh, yeah, Ju a Jewish hero named Judas. Not that Judas, not Judas Iscariot. And uh, we celebrate his, his valor every year, uh, the Jews do, and, and, and we give a wink and a nod, and we call it Hanukkah, Hanukkah. And so she's going to play that, and then we'll be right back. Grab your Bibles. We're going to go right back into the biographies of Jesus, and we're going to look in the Gospel of Mark and pick up right where we left off two Sundays ago. I'm glad you're watching. Are you ready for a miracle? Are you ready to be blessed? Nora Kate, take it away, baby. <laughs>
right. Thank you, sweetheart. That was tremendous. Look at you over there. Hey, uh, I always wanted to be able to, I always wanted to be able to play the violin. I just did. All of, I just thought that's such an elegant and such a, you know, it's like, you know, highbrow and all of that. But, you know, I, did, I never wanted to learn how to play it. <laughs> I just wanted to be able to play it. You know, like I always wanted to be a doctor. I just never wanted to become a doctor. <laughs> I just wanted God to hit me with a lightning bolt and then, boom, I could play. But, uh, but she, she took it up when I think she was six. She played in here for the first time. She played Happy Birthday Jesus when she was six years old. And uh, so she's been playing now. She's practicing. And so she's putting in the hard work to do it. God bless her. And that's Tammy. Tammy right here. That's her granddaughter. And uh, you know how Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. Well, if you've seen Norcate, you've seen the grandmother. <laughs> and that's, uh, they, are, they are buddies. They are just alike. Friends, if you have your Bibles, look with me in Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, and we're picking up the gospel right where we left off the story. Now, we're jumping around a little bit from the different, the different Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because we're really concerned with the biographies of Jesus, and we're taking them as systematically as we can. Now, we are not quite at the point where Jesus does the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, but since I preached on the Sermon on the Mount passages, some of them last fall and I think and maybe last summer uh, I'm not going to hit those in the biography that's that's very strong it's what Jesus preached and what I'm thinking about doing is just opening up the Sermon on the Mount and reading it when we get to the point where we're talking more about what Jesus said but this biography is is mostly concerned with what Jesus did and that will in Mark's gospel here while the birth narratives and, and those stories that we read uh, are only appear in, in Matthew and Luke, Mark gives us lots of action stories. Mark picks it up with Jesus' baptism as an adult. So when last we met, Jesus was calling Peter. You remember that. Let's take a look at Mark chapter 1, verse 40, and we're going to read to the end of the passage, and then go into chapter 2 and pick up the first story in chapter 2. And those of you who've been hanging around me for the last several years, who've been with me on mission trips, revivals, or camp meetings, those kind of things that I, I preached around and about different places, have heard me preach on this. I have a, the second story we're going to read, I have a sermon on this I like to preach, but I'm not going to preach it tonight. What I'm going to do is read the scripture and then encourage you to believe for each other. I'm not going to preach a sermon, but I'm going to, I'm going to preach a, uh, read an extended passage from chapter 1 and chapter 2, and then at the end, we're going to encourage each other to believe for one another. Let's look at verse 40. A man with leprosy came to Jesus and begged him on his knees, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Do you remember how we said... Uh, I think two weeks ago that uh, the most powerful a prayer that we could ever pray is found in table grace. God is great. God is good. Let us take, thank him for our food. And we said that God is great means that God uh, is all powerful, right? He's omnipotent. He can do it. But when we say God is great, God is good, what we're teaching our children is that God can and God will. So this guy, this leper, had half of that. He said, if you are willing, you can heal me. What a, what a statement. And Jesus was filled with compassion. This is verse 41. Reached out his hand and touched the leper. Okay, Jesus, Jesus broke the law here. You're not supposed to touch a leper. It's interesting, isn't it? Jesus reached out, touched the man, and said, I am willing. Be clean. You know what? He didn't preach it. He didn't pray an hour, did he? You know, I pray. I pray. I, I'm, I don't pray as much as I should. But when I, but when I, get, uh, uh, when I get tuned in on it, I pray a long time. 
And I know that even sometimes here on these little, these little videos that we put out, maybe I prayed too long. Maybe you'll look at the thing and say, 50 minutes, holy cow, Scott's long-winded today. You just don't want to listen to the whole thing. And then you'll notice we, about half of it is preaching and about half of it's praying. Jesus, when Jesus prayed for people publicly, he said two words. Here he said, be clean. Other times he said, be healed. There was no argument. There was not, he, he's not working God for a miracle. He's just doing it. Listen to what he says. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was cured. And Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. And Jesus is telling him, see that you don't tell anyone but go first, he means, go show yourself to the priest and offer sacrifice, the sacrifices that Moses commanded. In other words, obey the Old Testament law for your cleansing as a testimony to them. So before you tell anybody around here, go to your, go to your church and show this to the priest and get them to say, yes, this really happened. Now, Jesus has given them the protocols that Moses gave them in the Old Testament. So Jesus told him to keep the law. While the verse above it, Jesus broke the law <laughs> and by, by touching him. But Jesus is wanting to uh, give a witness to who he is to the priest. Now, we know that the, the priesthood was a political organization, and they eventually turned against Jesus, and we give them a hard time for it, and rightly so. But you know, there were quite a few priests who believed in Jesus. Remember, Nicodemus came to Jesus in the third chapter of John? And do you remember Joseph of Arimathea who believed in Jesus and loaned Jesus his family tomb to be buried in? And you remember... a. a a priest named Lazarus that was Jesus' best buddy, and he, Jesus raised him from the dead. La, uh, John chapter 11 says Lazarus was Jesus' best friend. And, and you remember uh, one named Jairus who was a priest, and he had a little girl who was about 10 or 12 years old, and she died. And Jesus was on his way. I'll, I'll preach on this eventually, but Jesus was on his way to his house, and Jesus went up and raised him from the dead. There a lot of good priests in the in the New Testament. So, but we always think of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, those who the priests are, of all being villains. But they weren't all villains. There were some great ones. And, and the Bible name, names them. So, so let's give them a shout out. But Jesus wanted a witness to them too. But instead of doing what Jesus said, this guy that Jesus healed went out, began to talk freely, spreading the news. And he caused such a commotion that people came to Jesus and they just ran him out of town. <laughs> and uh, everybody wanted Jesus to touch him and heal him, but nobody wanted to listen to what Jesus had to say. So this kind of interrupted his preaching schedule because Jesus had a mission to heal the sick and cast out demons and feed the hungry and that kind of thing. But Jesus also had a mission to preach the kingdom. And so the crowds just... No, you know, we don't want to stay. You know what it would be like if you went to see Oral Roberts or Benny Hinn or one of the healing ministers and, and you say, okay, they're going to be preaching at 7 o'clock so they'll sing for an hour, then they'll take up the offering for an hour and they'll, they'll preach for an hour. That's 10 o'clock. Well, I'm going to go in about 10, 15 and see if I can get healed. <laughs> in other words, you want the goodies, but you don't want to hear the message. You know, that's a mistake. That's a mistake. There's a wealthy man in North Carolina uh, on the eastern side of the United States. I I'm, I'm think North Carolina. It might be Atlanta. I think he's in North Carolina. And he, he called up uh, in the 1950s, he called Oral Roberts. He heard about his anointing to heal. And he called him up on the phone and said, hey, listen, I'm a wealthy man. I'm going to send my plane to get you. And I've only got six months to live. I got cancer. And I want, I'm going to fly you to my house and I want you to pray for me and cure me of my cancer. And old Robert said, well, you know, it takes faith to do something like that. And faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. He said, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to be in Atlanta, not far from North Carolina, you know, right there in Georgia. 
And I'll be there in about a month holding a crusade. I want you to come to the crusade and hear me preach. Hear me preach on healing. Hear me preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let, hear me preach on salvation. Hear me preach on the Holy Spirit. And once you heard the gospel preached, then I will pray for you. And that man got furious at Old Roberts. And he said, I don't have time to go and sit in in that auditorium or under that tent or whatever he was doing in those days and listen to you preach. I need to be healed and I need to be healed now. And Oral said, uh, he said, I can't help you. He said, I'll write you a fat check. He said, I can't help you at any price. He said he had time to die, but he didn't have time to listen to the gospel. <laughs> mm, my goodness. So that's what happened right here with Jesus. This is exactly what happened. So Jesus pulls away. Let's go to chapter 2, verse 1. A few days later, Jesus gets back to Capernaum, his hometown. And people had heard that he had come home. The home is there. Jesus has a house. That's uh, A lot of people say, oh, Jesus was homeless. The Bible says he was homeless. J Jesus is not homeless. Jesus had a house. And they take a, a verse out of context that says, birds have nests, foxes have dens, the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. That's because he had gone into a town that had rejected him, and he had sent an advance crew. They were renting a room in that hotel that night in the inn, and they said, no, tell Jesus not to come to our city. So Jesus slept in the outdoors that night. Here, Jesus returns to his home. So a lot of people read this, they don't realize this happened not in anybody's house. It happened in Jesus' house. Look at verse 2. So many gathered that there was no one, no room left, not even outside the door. So he preached the word to them. And some men came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus, get their paralyzed friend to Jesus, he's on a mat, because of the crowd, they crawled on the roof, made a hole in the roof of Jesus' house right above where Jesus was sitting, digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like this? By the way, these are Jesus' home preacher this is his home church pastor he's blaspheming who can forgive sins but God alone and Jesus immediately this is a word of knowledge knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts he said to them why are you thinking these things which is easier to say to a paralytic your sins are forgiven or rise up and take your mat and walk which is easier to say? Which is easier to say for a preacher today? Your sins are forgiven or rise up and walk? It's easier to say your sins are forgiven. It's, that's easier to say. It's harder to say rise and... Because I can pronounce your sins are forgiven. I've got the authority to do that in the scripture. But I don't have the authority to guarantee that your sins are forgiven. <laughs> Because uh, I don't know your heart. Jesus said, which is easier to say? It's easier to say your sins are forgiven. But let me show you who I am. So he says, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Take up your mat and go home. And the crippled man got up, took up his mat, walked his way through the crowd and this amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this before. Isn't that just a great story? I just tell you, Jesus is, is, wants to preach the gospel. He wants to tell the message of the kingdom. He wants to tell people to live. He wants them to understand grace and mercy and, and all of those things. And, and thank God for Matthew because we would miss out on so much of what Jesus said if it weren't for Matthew's gospel. It's just filled with, with three whole chapters on the Sermon on the Mount. And then all those parables in Matthew that don't appear anywhere else or, or, or sporadically through the, the scriptures 
And uh, John gives us all these uh, sayings of Jesus that are the last day or two of Jesus' life. Seven chapters on the last week of Jesus' life. But John goes almost right to the end. And so Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptics, are, uh, give us more of these biographies. But I tell you, it's just such an exciting thing to read this and know how much that, that Jesus loves us. When I read this, I see not that Jesus, what Jesus can do, but I see what he will do. And I see that he cares about us spiritually and he cares about us physically. What do you see here? I see that, uh, that it's hard to believe sometimes that God is, is so good. And it's really hard to believe when you're, when you're under it. Can I tell you that it's important that you have a church no, let, no you, need to, you need to listen to me. It's not important that you have this church. Many of you come here, and, and that's great, and I, I'm glad that you do. When we have everybody, when, if everybody were to come on the same Sunday, we have uh, 300. But everybody doesn't come on the same Sunday. In fact, since the COVID, one year, one year ago next week, right? It's just, it's just been, you know, we had the two weeks to flatten the curve and the curve flattened us. <laughs> and uh, by the grace of God, we, you know, we keep the lights on and everything. God is, we haven't, we haven't missed one bill. Y'all can tell I'm starving. <laughs> but can I, can I just tell you this, that you need a church family that'll pray for you. Wherever you live, wherever you are, wherever you are in the world, we have people all over the place. A guy contacted me the other day from Haiti. It was, it was last fall. And he was watching. He was watching. He said, will you disciple me in the faith? I said, if I can. If I can. Listen, friends. Uh, you need a church family to pray for you. And it is so clear. Did you know that when you're feeling sick, when you, have the, when, when you get the bad report, when you get what the scripture calls the evil report, when the doctor tells you that it's hopeless or the doctor tells you that this is just your lot in life, your situation is not curable or your situation is, is uh, maybe treatable or your situation is degenerative and, and uh, it's not going to take you out, but you're going to have to live with it. It's hard to think happy thoughts. And, you know, somebody comes along that's never walked through hell and they give you some cliche. Don't you just hate cliches? Boy, I just hate them. I just hate them, hate them, hate them, hate them, hate them. Somebody says, well, don't worry, be happy. Don't you just want to knock them on their rear end? <laughs> Tell me to die. I just got the worst news you could, you could possibly hear. And, and, then, and then somebody tells you, I've heard this all my life. I, and... I typically don't say it because it's such a total nonsense. I just want to use some language that Peter might have used. <laughs> you know, I just want to say something ugly. But when I hear somebody say, you just got to accept what the good Lord puts on you. And they say like that, they'll say, well, you know, the Lord won't put on you more than you can handle. I don't even know what that means. You mean, you mean all of these disasters that we have in life or that God put it on us? Is that what you really think? See, I don't think that. And, and you know what? Because you know what? I've, my daughter goes to Whitfield once and twice a week. She, she's a chaplain and for hospice. And friends, I have been to the East Mississippi Mental Hospital. And I have been to the VA mental unit. Many times where they lock those doors. I have been to the, the mental units at, in hospitals in Meridian to, to see church members and to see the family of church members. I've seen World War II veterans and Vietnam veterans and, and that sometimes Gulf War veterans. They're, and these are young people and they have been through PTSD and they have lost their minds and they, and, and they have more on them than they can handle. 
And you're going to come along and say, don't worry, be happy. Somebody needs to pop you upside your head. That is just no way. You know, when, when you're under such an enormous strain in your life, and when your business has gone bankrupt, or the doctor has given you a terrible report, or you have bad news from a son or a daughter or a mother and father, it can come completely out of left field. You can go to bed one night on top of the world, and by the time you wake up in the morning, your life is forever changed. And it just begs the question, and let me put this on you. And I'm not preaching, I'm teaching. It's, uh, where do you go when you don't know where to go? And what do you do when you don't know what to do? What do you do when, when life has come along and hit you so hard in your solar plexus that you can't even catch your breath? Just, you really need somebody to give you the, a book on the power of positive thinking. It's got all these stories about how people thought positive and they won the lottery in their state. Really? A lottery ticket? That's your hope for tomorrow? A lottery ticket? A scratcher? Listen to me, friends. What you need in your moment of desperation, in your moment, this guy's a is a paralytic. He is paralyzed. He's paralyzed physically. He's paralyzed emotionally. He is paralyzed spiritually. I don't know what happened to him. I don't know if he was born that way. I don't know if he was an accident. It doesn't matter. He's paralyzed. He cannot walk. Yesterday he was crippled. Today he's crippled. Tomorrow he's crippled. He had nothing in his life to give him hope except he had four friends. You see, that's the body of Christ. And they took him to Jesus. And that's what we, that's what the church is. That's what we're about, friends. It's to bring people to Jesus in their moment of need, in their crisis moment. And when they got to Jesus, the house was so full. Somebody, somebody still hung up. I said this was Jesus' house. No, it wasn't. Don't, don't get hung up on that. If it makes you feel better, say it's Peter's house. Jesus didn't live with Peter. But you can say it's Peter's house just to make you feel better. But it's, it's not their house. <laughs> you see these four guys? It's not their house. And they crawl up on the roof and they figure about where Jesus is sitting in there. He's probably sitting back there in the living room next to, next to the kitchen. And they go on the roof and they tear a hole. And Jesus is sitting there preaching. And he sees some of that fat grass roof dirt adobe thing. <laughs> it starts falling down. And it goes like this. Huh. And so Jesus is, and the kingdom of God is likened to a, you know, he's preaching. And he's going like that, you know, and, and Jesus is just, oops, my shirt's not working. And Jesus, finally he just gets tired of it and he looks up and there's a hole in his roof. And it, it, it's, it's his roof or it's the other guy's roof. But whoever's roof it is, it's not their roof. And they tear a hole in his roof and they lower that man down to Jesus. Because, because, friends, the most important thing you can do in the world is bring your friends to Jesus. And the next part of this story is just incredible. See, they had heard about the leper in the previous chapter. Are you connecting all this? They heard that Jesus could do these things. And so Jesus looked up, and this is what the Bible says, when Jesus saw their faith, not his faith, he's crippled emotionally, physically, spiritually. He's, he's crippled. He's a paralytic. He's laying there. When Jesus saw their faith, the faith of the four holding the rope, when Jesus saw their faith, friends, that's what the church is about. That's what the kingdom is about. When Jesus saw their faith... I know these, I know people 
who if you get sick and they pray for you and you don't get healed, people will ridicule you. And they'll say, where's your faith, man? People have said it to me when I've been sick. They said it to my dad when he was sick. That is such a terrible thing to say. You know what I learned? I learned from Joni Erickson uh, Tata. Johnny Erickson Tata. You know, she's crippled from the neck down. She paints with her teeth. When people in her church say, uh, Johnny, why don't you just have faith? Where's your faith? And she says, where's yours? <laughs> Because you know what, friends? It's not the faith of the sick one. It's the faith of the church of the sick one that's on trial. Can I tell you that? It's the truth. The Bible says, if, is there any sick among you? Let the sick person call for the elders of the church to gather around them and anoint them. And their faith, the prayer of the, prayer of the righteous will heal the sick, and if they've committed any sins, they will be forgiven. Because when Jesus does something, he just doesn't do it halfway. You see what he did? He healed this man, and he forgave this man. This man got saved, he got delivered, and he got healed. And you know what Jesus did after he healed him? It's a wonderful thing. Did you miss it? Because a lot of people do. You know what Jesus did after he got healed? After he got healed, he shook his finger in the face and he said, you better go out there and be perfect because if I see you backsliding, I'm going to smack you down like you've never seen. He, do you think Jesus said that to that man? No, he said, rise up, take your mat and go home. Go home. He said, you got a wife somewhere. You got some children somewhere. Maybe you got a mama somewhere. Maybe you were raised by your grandmama. You got an aunt and an uncle and they just really want to see you. You rise up and you take your mat and you go home. You don't have to go to the temple. You don't have to show yourself to the priest. Don't worry about all that law. You go and you tell your family that you're home. You get your life back. You get your legs back. You get your life back. You get your family back. Go home to your wife. Take her out tonight. Y'all go dancing. Take her out to eat. Take her around the dance floor. It's been a while since you've done that. Go home and, and you just have a honeymoon and you chase your kids around the yard. Jesus said, I'm giving you your life back. You know, friends, how did all that happen? Well, for sure, 100% sure. I don't want to diminish this in any way. 100% sure it happened because God is good. Because Jesus is Lord. So let me say that. Let, let me, I don't want anybody to walk away from this thinking that I've diminished that in any way. I absolutely have not. But let me give you, let me be bolder. Let me just be bolder. It happened because four men loved that paralyzed man so much that they were willing to rip the roof off a stranger's house to get him to Jesus. Because faith is a four-letter word, and it's called R-I-S-K. And you know what I'm doing? If they're tearing the roof off my house, I'm asking, who's going to pay for this? Jesus didn't say, who's going to pay for this? Jesus said, wow, look at their faith. Rise and be healed. I want to ask you something, friends. Do you know anybody in the world who loves you so much that they are willing to tear the roof off a, 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 off a house to get you blessed? Boy, I don't know. I've got good friends. I got lots of friends. So Ellen said, you got 1,800 people on your Facebook. Who, who are these people? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> and that's the truth. I bet, I bet 1,100 of them I've never even seen. I got lots and lots and lots of people from around the world that I've connected with that I'm not, I don't even recognize their faces or their names. They just, they, so they, they're sort of acquaintances. And then I've got an inner circle of friends People I see almost every day or talk to every week. But who do I know that would rip a roof off a house 
to, to put me and to connect me. I don't know. I don't know. You know what kind of, you know what kind of church I want us to be? I, I don't know if we're there yet, but I know we're marching to Zion. We're marching to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Can I tell you that my dream for our church is that we would be the kind of church that would tear the roof off a house if that's what it takes to get you into the presence of Almighty God. That's the kind of church I want to belong to. And that's the kind of church I want, to, I want to lead. Friends, we want to be that church for you. And so we want to connect with you. We want your prayer request. We want your addresses. We will never in a million years uh, send you a statement asking you for money. The good people of Florida pay all of these bills. Friends, we have one goal. That's to be a conduit, a blessing to you. We want to be the four friends who hold the rope and lower you into the presence of Jesus. You know what those four guys' names are? You know what their names are? See, I don't. <laughs> because the Bible gives us a lot of names. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Peter, and Paul, and Jesus, and, and James, and... and uh, Abraham and Moses, but we don't know who these guys are. When I get to heaven, I'm going to look these guys up. I want to know who these four men were who just heard a rumor that if they could get their friend to Jesus, Jesus would heal him and give him his life back. These guys are heroes. We don't want to be famous. We want to be faithful. I'm calling you to enter into covenant with us. We don't want to be famous. We want to be faithful. We'll happily do it anonymously. But we are going to hold the rope for you. All right. All right. Mr. Carl. Brother Carl. Praise team. Y'all take it away. I'm going to be right back to pray for you. No. 
Thank you so much. That's a beautiful song, isn't it? Hallelujah. Friends, pray with me right now. Father, in Jesus' name, we hold the rope, Lord, for those who are, those who are sick, those who are paralyzed by depression, those who are paralyzed by sickness and disease, those who are in despair, those who've been run over by life, those who are those who are just keeping their head above water financially and those who are just keeping their head above water financial, uh, emotionally, those who just are barely getting by, those who have no money. Lord, I know that this is, that uh, money is an uncomfortable subject, Lord, but I know that many people who are watching this morning who are worshiping with us are struggling a little bit financially and and the uh, situation in our country is just kind of crazy. So we pray right now, Lord Jesus, we pray for those who are tuned in, Lord. And they would never put their name on the prayer list for a financial need. People just won't do that. And they'll never ask me to pray for them over a financial situation. Nobody ever mentions those things. It's a very, very, very private thing. But Lord, I think of this paralytic here in the scripture. And when he lost his legs, he, he lost his livelihood. He lost his future. He lost all hope. And uh, how would he live? How would he live? But he had four friends who had barely heard of Jesus because this is... Jesus' ministry is brand new. And uh, they heard a rumor, just, just a rumor, that if they could get their friend to Jesus, Jesus would heal him. And Lord, they had experienced healers before in the land, and, and they're always left them disappointed. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But they risk it, Lord. They stepped out on faith. And Lord, they had extraordinary faith. Lord, so much faith that they would drag his lifeless, dead weight body to the roof of a house. 
and tear out the roof and lower Jesus, lower this man through the, through the roof until he came right into the very presence of Jesus. And Lord, how powerful that is. What a wonderful image it is. And it's, it's a metaphor for how we should love the world around us and how we should effort and, 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 and as strongly as we can bring people to Jesus. Lord, but in this story, in the Bible, it's not a metaphor. They literally brought him to Jesus and they uh, literally took the roof off the house and they literally lowered him down, Lord. It was an extreme it was an act of extreme faith and extreme love to a God that loved them extremely and was ready right then to meet their needs. And Lord, there was no uh, uh, sinner's prayer. Jesus, out of an abundance of compassion, healed that man and forgave his sins. What a, what a mighty God we serve. He said, your sins are forgiven. And it's not even because of your faith. It's just because of the faith of your friends I've forgiven your sins. Lord, you are so good. And so, Lord, we're holding the rope in our church. We're holding the rope for several. Some are on our prayer list, Lord, and, and we pray for them. But, but a multitude more are in our hearts, Lord, and we try with all of our might, all of our hearts, Lord. Lord, to, to believe and to hold on to that rope and to and to cling to the mercy of God. So Lord, hear us, hear us when we pray. Know, Lord, that we're praying not just for ourselves, but we're praying for our friends, and we're praying for friends of friends, and for our church family, but for our extended church family, and not just those in this denomination or a part of this movement, Lord, but for all of those who connect to us from a multitude of backgrounds, from a multitude of countries and cities all across the country, all around the world. Lord, we pray and we ask you to bless. Lord, we're so excited this very week to get testimonies of people who've listened and people who were touched by God. And Lord, we're just, and we live for the testimony. A lot of things we do, Lord, we do it for the testimony. Like Jesus told the, the leper in the previous story, just the verses or two above it, Lord. He says, go to the temple and go to the synagogue, go to the priest, like Moses commanded you to do. And go and tell them and be a witness to them. Because Jesus, even though the, the ruling class, the priest, many of them rejected Jesus and ultimately conspired against him and had him killed, Jesus still wanted to love and to reach as many of those as he could. And even, even on the cross, he forgave them. Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. He showed his mercy. He showed his love even at the point of his own death. So, Lord, bless, we pray. Lord, we, we pray in Jesus' name and we pray for your glory. Lord, we pray God is great and God is good. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray and believe. Amen and amen. Well, praise God. Friends, I'm so glad. Hey, guess what? When we see each other next week, it will be March. March the 7th. Is that what next Sunday is? And uh, uh, that's going to be exciting. And then about the third week of March is when spring comes, right? And then we just look forward to what God has for us. Listen, friends, we've got many exciting announcements we'll be given in the next couple of months. God is doing great things. We have a love gift for you for March. You'll get it in a week or two. But I need your address, so let us have it. Uh, this is not a come on. We are not that type of Christian. We want to bless you. We love you. And I will see you next week either in here or on your computer. But I look forward to it. God bless you.